Hello and welcome to Strange New Broadcast episode 2.6 with Anne-Marie and Peter. Hello. We have some previously on from Among the Lotus Eaters. Yes, that's two episodes ago. We've heard from Martin, who writes, I never saw the point of going back to this planet, and in fact I never even recognised it until I was told. I liked the premise and overall liked the episode, but this seemed like a pointless reference when it could have just been a new planet. Yeah, yeah kind of. Yes, and then we covered charades. And it was bugging me that you brought up you have been cordially invited. Yeah. And I said and the it similarities. Ha- yeah. And uh, we we watched that. What was the same night? I think yeah. after we'd recorded the podcast. And uh, yeah, it's it's a lot more fun, a lot funnier. <laughs> and it features a toilet, which Odo and Kira are talking in, but we don't really see much of it. it has to be said. No. But one of them is sitting on it with a seat down. So yeah. there you are. Not our first toilet in a <laughs> strange world. <laughs> no. Though no. technically that's a Cardassian one, of course. So. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> True. So maybe it's the first Starship toilet. I don't know. I'm. I can't be asked to go back and you know search through a whole load of other episodes no. to see whether a toilet. Toilet. No, that, I think that's just, not the greatest no. use of our time. No, least. not really. No. 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 Anyway, tonight we're covering Lost in Translation, <laughs> aka Strange New Nebula, because we can't actually do a Strange New World ever. <laughs> oh, well, they did the very the pilot, didn't they? Did they? Yeah. Did they? The very first episode of Strange New World. Oh, as in way back when? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I meant this season more than anything. I'm sure we did a few, actually, in the, the um, first season, but there we are. Communications officer's log, Stardate 2394.8. Enterprise has been sent to Bannon's Nebula on the edge of explored space. I've seen a lot of nebulas, but this one's special. It's a stellar nursery, the birthplace of new stars. But that's not why we're here. The nursery is also full of deuterium, starship fuel. Starfleet's building an outpost here to collect and refine it. If they can ever get it working. Okay, so you have a bit of a recap, again, just in case there's anything that you've missed from before. And I think it's particularly important for anybody who was jumping on in Season 2 who wouldn't know who... Yeah, uh, yeah, there's a bit of backstory here. And then it's Uhura doing a communications log. Um, they've been sent to, and it sounded to me like Venom's Nebula, but I don't think that's what it was actually called. No. Um, and it's a nursery where stars grow, and it's also full of deuterium, which is what their fuel is. So they're going to be collecting it and refining it, but they also they're building a re- a refinery there as well. Yeah, which had horrible uh, echoes of Star Trek Insurrection, unfortunately. <laughs> it made me think of there's an episode of Next Gen with some kind of refinery type thing in it and it was a card in the ccg yeah i mean can't remember any refineries off the top of my head there were various stellar observatories but the refinery here definitely has that it's got that big sort of solar sail type affair that they had in insurrection oh okay okay and then you find out that ahura has not been sleeping and then you also find out that pike is fleet captain because he's got command of the farragut and the refinery while they're all working on it and she gets congratulations on his promotion he's like yeah it's only temporary which is which is true i mean the moment the op- that operation is dealt with the ship will two ships will go their different ways and it won't be anymore but it's still nice so because he, he's been effectively made senior to the captain of the farragut hmm. well, of course he he gets made a permanent fleet captain by the time of menagerie and the silly thing is, he's got this new insignia to show that he's a fleet captain, but Spock hasn't noticed it because he's surprised when Una comes in and says, I hear congratulations are ordered, and it's like, well, you got promoted? He's like, did you not see the badge? <laughs> it's pretty obvious. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> kind of feel like the, you know, the costume department you know, didn't read the script and went, oh, let's give him a new badge without realising that that wouldn't work with what the dialogue is. But anyway. Oh, well. I mean, I didn't notice, but never mind. You didn't notice the badge? No. Oh. <laughs> You're talking to somebody who managed to not notice a nine foot inflatable reindeer. Okay. So I'm just good at not noticing things. Right. <laughs> Unless I'm specifically being tasked with noticing things, in which case then I do. Uh huh. Anyway, because of all the deuterium around, Kirk says to Ortegas, you know, actually we could do with um, refueling 
ourselves. So they open the Bussard collectors. Have we ever seen this done before? No, because obviously the original series model couldn't do anything like that. No, I mean more in, have we seen Bussard collectors opening and working in later iterations of Trek? Mm, not looking mechanical like this. Uh, yes, they did in Next Gen, but it, it wasn't. It was just like a glowy thing. It wasn't uh, mechanical bits moving because it was a physical yeah. model. It's very hard to do that sort of thing with physical models unless you're doing Thunderbirds, basically. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Anyway, I liked it. But did you not, when you first saw this, did you not go, ah, I bet there's life in that or something? It was. It just immediately that put you onto the of exactly how the plot was going to turn out. I don't know why, but it immediately that's what I thought. No. No. Okay, it was just me then. Right. <laughs> Is this one you come back to, by the way? No, I haven't, uh-huh. and I think I think I haven't because there's not, to me anyway, that much to get out of it. Watching a second time, yeah, I think you're probably right. So some of them, it's humour. Some of them, you might appreciate another layer of something somewhere along mm-hmm. the line. Sometimes it's just warm and glowy. Yeah, this, this um, but this is this is this isn't a warm and glowy one, no. is it? And I just. So, no. Okay. But Uhura receives a signal and then it goes. So then she starts running a full diagnostic. And for her, that includes going down to engineering and checking things there, where she's watching a video of Hamer who told her how to fix the problem because she kept bugging him. And then Pelia appears. It's like, what are you doing? And so she explains. And then Pelia says, well, how come you've never talked to me? And she's like, oh, you know... I've been busy, and it's one of the things that picks up in this episode is people aren't talking to Pelia because she's replaced Hamer. Hamer. But it's like, really? Does Starfleet do that then? Because, you know, they lose people often enough. Yeah, you'd think. (laughs) So, I don't know. I mean, admittedly, a lot of this crew are quite young, so I suppose someone like Uhura has only just made Ensign. I think that's it's fair that she's struggling with it more because she may well have not been, you know... Plus, there's also the losing their parents' business as well. That's yeah, be... but Una? Yeah, you'd have thought Una would be used to it by now. I think you got the impression that she was a bit older. I mean, she's a commander after all, yeah. so... Yeah, a bit stupid, isn't it? Yeah. Anyway, one of the things in the video you see of Hamer is that he uh, he makes her jump and one of the things he, he says mm. to her is be less gullible, which I, I like. Yeah. And one of the things you have had in the recap is how she was closed off And it was Hamer that made her open herself up to friendship and everything again. Mm. And so it is particularly painful for her. It's a shame because it reminds you of what a good character he was because he was generally really grumpy and cross-patched, but he had these wonderful humorous moments. And it's like, we really miss that now, actually, unfortunately. Not that I don't like Pellia, but to be fair, and she's okay in this episode, but, you know, you do miss Hamer, to be honest. Yeah, (laughs) you do. And the whole thing with Uhura missing him so much totally makes sense in terms of what's gone on with the story. It's it's Una that I don't really get. Mm. And then you have Pike and Una talking, and Pike says that you know it should be the refinery should be online now, but not but it isn't because of what Starfleet is calling organisational difficulties. So it's like yeah, they need your brand of management basically. So he doesn't actually say go down there, kick ass, and take names, but that's pretty <laughs> yeah. much what he's you know what he means. Release the Una. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Then Uhura hears those voices again and she sees a zombie hamer in the lift and that's your teaser. Yeah. I like the zombie hamer. And then when you come back, Uhura's getting herself checked out and she's told she's got deuterium poisoning. It's a mild case, but it's made worse by her lack of sleep. And one of the symptoms is hallucinations, but it also includes headaches, nausea, a whole load of other stuff. And and Benga is like, you know, I prescribe sleep and it's quite clear that she's not going to. And he's like, right, you're not fit for duty. Until you slept, Hmm. which I like. And then on the refinery, Pelia and Una are disagreeing about what should be done when and everything else. And Pelia says that, you know, she smells an underlying issue. And Una's like, yeah, I don't work on the basis of hunches and smells. Yeah. I quite like the tension between these two characters. I mean, yes, it's silly that part of it's coming out of Una's problem with uh, replacing Aima. But nevertheless, it's it's a very different character. She is. You can understand Pelia's character being exactly the sort of person to rub Una up the wrong way. (laughs) Yeah, you can. The same way that uh, Sam Kirk rubbed Spock up the wrong way. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, trying to sleep, Uhura hears the sounds again and she sees a fire. Do, do the sounds remind you a bit of Transformers? No, they reminded me of not Transformers, but they reminded me of something else, but I haven't been able to put my finger on it. Oh, or maybe they're a pan-dimensional alien is trying to contact you then? No. I think 
one of the reasons this... I, I love the way you just said no really matter-of-factly like I was being serious. <laughs> <laughs> Let me consider that for a minute. No, I don't think so, actually. <laughs> I think one of the reasons I haven't watched this episode again is because even before I knew what happened, to me, that sound sounded to me like jumbled up voices. Mm-hmm. And I think, but Gives I can't... Away too much. Yeah, yeah, and I think, but I can't be certain. It's an episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine where eventually they manage to unjumble the sound and it turns out to be an overlaid recording of Kira's own voice going, that's one, that's two, and all her friends are... Playback message. That's one. Oh, um, yes. So. Yeah. But I th- but if initially all they've got is a jumbled sound. Yeah. Well, that's really creepy, that one, isn't it? Yeah. I like that one. That's another DS9 episode I want to revisit now. Um, I think we really need to do a rewatch, you know, but there's so many other things to watch. Yes. <laughs> but anyway, I could be wrong about where I'm placing it, but I have definitely, on Star Trek, heard a sound not identical, but similar enough to this where it you had to unpick it yeah, and when you did, it was voices. Mm. Okay. And so I was like, the moment we we heard that sound, like for a long enough period, rather, because the very first time you hear it, it's very brief. But the moment we heard it for long enough, I went, oh, yeah, that's voices, isn't it? It's trying to communicate. It's, where's the tension? Now, fair enough, there might be loads of people watching this who never thought it was, and who therefore did find tension in it. Oh, fine, I've got no issue with that. But for me... It was this. I knew I recognised the sound, so it didn't really work. Mm. And then Kirk beams aboard, and he says how much he likes the ship. And the brothers put their arms around each other and head to the bar. Yeah, well, good. Not Kirk is back because we needed him. I uh, did. Yeah. And it turns out that James T is the youngest first officer ever, and he's taken the. And did you not find this scene incredibly odd? There's one very minor character from the Enterprise and this other not Kirk that we've seen once, but he's been parallel universe and another again when he was parallel universe. It's like, why are we supposed to be, uh, what's the word? Caring? Uh, yeah, why, do, why are we supposed to care about these two characters? I mean, it's just bizarre. I don't mind. About they're taking up so much time in the episode. There are all these other minor characters that we're not spending time with and you're dealing with this bloody Kirk that isn't Kirk. It's just madness. I think it brings out something of Sam Kirk's character. But again, Sam Kirk isn't a main character. I mean, he was a joke, basically. It was like, you know, send Lieutenant Kirk to the bridge. It's like, oh, hang on, they're doing Kirk, are they? And it turns out to be Sam Kirk. That was a really good joke. But really, that's the only, you know, reason for him existing. It doesn't bother me at all. That an annoying Spock. <laughs> yeah, but so it, it does, that doesn't bother me at all. So, yes, it turns out that James T's taken the award of youngest first officer ever off of his dad. And Sam's like, talks of, goes on about how, you know, you're going to make our, our dad proud, unlike me. So clearly there's a lot of sibling rivalry there. And Sam is a, a scientist and clearly not a bold adventurer. And it, to me, the whole thing with all of this comes across really as... Sam is actually resentful towards his dad, which is why he calls himself Sam, because actually he's known as George after his dad. But he takes it all out on Kirk, because Kirk's the one who gets the praise and the recognition from their dad. But he is, as it comes out later, you know, he is a scientist and he loves his work, and he should be allowed to just love his work. And I don't like the Shatner Kirk, I don't like the character, particularly. And if this is the backstory, that they've basically got an arse of a dad who has a very clear idea about what a successful career is and it involves doing all the things that annoy me about Kirk, that goes some way to explain why he's a knobhead. (laughs) I think it's a shame we're wasting time on Kirk because this series shouldn't be about Kirk. It should be about Pike, basically. I mean, there's not enough Pike in this season so far and this isn't helping the situation. (laughs) I think if I... I didn't personally feel that the focus was James Kirk. I felt the focus was Sam Kirk, in that scene anyway. Well, I was going to say, there's barely any of Sam Kirk in this. It's mainly James Kirk, I think, of I. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, there's a reason why he's in this, but the reason is pathetic, but we'll get to that. Anyway, then you have Pelia, who says that she's found evidence of sabotage. And then you've got Chapel and Spock paying 3D chess and Spock wants to tell Starfleet about their relationship and Chapel's like, it's like Schrodinger's cat. Yeah, all very weird. And I mean, this shouldn't be happening either, obviously, but the, 
it's very curious because they have to give a, lo- a large amount of the story so far bit at the start to explain that these two are now a thing because uh, he and Tepring aren't a thing anymore. Uh, just for this one scene, I think is the only two scene with the two of them together, and it doesn't really go anywhere. It was like, really? <laughs> it was it was worth including all that stuff just for this bit. <laughs> I mean, I I kind of like the Schrodinger's cat bit that. Uh, you know, that's a nice sort of base for a, a relationship. But again, it shouldn't be chapel. But anyway, move on. Okay. Again, I don't mind B, C, D, whatever plots with small things going on with other minor characters. It reminds me a bit of Deep Space Nine where there would be a tiny, tiny plot somewhere along the lines of, in the early seasons, of Jake and Nog making people itch or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it's... Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> that for me, that's where it is. That's the level. This is this uh-huh. is the this is the Strange New Worlds equivalent of Jake and Nog making people itch. It's just a very small scene that you you shouldn't expect much from necessarily. Well, as I say, and I wouldn't accept that they'd laid the, the ground so much. <laughs> you yeah. know, there was so much intro for just that one scene. <laughs> Weird, but anyway, makes actually makes me wonder what was cut out. To be honest, well, possibly the um, a deleted yeah. scene. Or anyway, that shouldn't have been there either. Anyway, Ahura appears and tells Spock and Chapel that it can't be deuterium poisoning because she first turned the sound on the bridge before she was exposed to the deuterium. But anyway, they have reasons to not agree with her and just and to just say, look, you know, you're suffering from exhaustion. And so she sits down at the bar where Kirk is and she's really cross because she's like, you're trying to hit on me. And he denies it. I think he was, but hmm. doesn't but doesn't mind not if you see what I mean. But he was, I think. But I like he then says, oh, your Vulcan friend's two moves away from losing until you distracted him so i think one of the things that they are trying to do is to seed the early relationship between kirk and spock that's the the only reason for perk perk yes perk. captain perk captain perk i've yeah. called him so many things so far <laughs> now we've captain gone with perk, perk. Uh, for, for him being it was that scene at the end where they shake hands which really was a complete non-event because it just the episode just fades out and that wasn't what the episode was about no. it was like Oh, really? And it just reminded me horribly of that the solo film, where it's like, you know, oh, here's Han meeting Chewie, and here's Han getting the the Falcon, and it's just like, oh, really? We don't need to see all this stuff. It's stupid fan wank. Hey-ho. <laughs> Clearly, that's what they were doing with their hands either before or after, but yeah. What? Did they shake their wanking hands? I, d- I don't know. I don't know which hands they used to wank. Do oh. Vulcans even wank? I don't want to know. Let's move on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I bet there's some yeah. really crappy slash fiction out there about it, but I don't want to know. Okay. <laughs> anyway, Ihira hears the sounds again and sees the crew massacred. And then she hallucinates a fight with herself. And then as a result of this fight with herself, she lamps Kirk. I, I was... Uh, that would have had a lot more impact if it wasn't clearly her fighting a double all the time. In Deep Space Nine and... Next generation, even so often they did that clever split screen thing, so you could have two characters on the screen at the same time. I don't know, maybe it's too difficult to show them fighting. I'm not sure, I can't remember if we saw that or not. But here, so obviously, somebody fighting a you know a double that it was, but it didn't really have the impact it should have done. Also, given that what we find out at the end, I don't know why it needed to be herself and why she couldn't have been attacking an enemy from her memories, given that they use the memories to communicate, and which would have made more sense. Hmm. Kirk wants to know that she's all right and doesn't want to report her, so goes with her to her quarters where she's got a dermal regenerator. And he thinks to check in, because she says, you know, I'm the only one with these symptoms, on the Enterprise at least, and he's like, well, let me check in with the Farragut's doctor. Meanwhile, trying to investigate the cause of the, the sabotage, the crew on the refinery find a scared and hallucinating Starfleet officer. Lieutenant Ramon. Why do I know the name Ramon? Uh, that was Spaghetti Western. The heart, Ramon. Don't forget the heart. <laughs> God, it eases yeah. me. Yes. I'm Ramon. Sitting... Yeah, I'm messes sit... with Ramon. Yes, I'm sitting there thinking, what's the Michael? Yeah, it is. It, it's... it's a fairly common spelling name, to be honest. Sorry, so. but it, it did make me think something very specific, but that is exactly what it is. <laughs> That's exa- Sorry, yes. As you can probably tell, I am very easily sidetracked. Yeah. Meanwhile, on the ship, Ahira sees a red alert, so she rushes to the bridge where the view screen explodes because it's only made of glass because that's intelligent. <sighs> Don't get me started. Ever since 
freaking 09 we've had this ridiculousness. Why would you have a piece of glass on the front of your ship? It you, is so you stupid. Don't. It's a fucking projector screen. It's a wall. Well, isn't it, it? Up, up until 09, that was the truth and the sensible truth. But no, I mean, it was always daft enough the bridge was where it was at. But then to make it a big piece of glass oh. on the front, you're just asking for this to happen. Yes. Stupid. Very. Anyway, the crew all get flushed outside and. Then suddenly they're not, and she's like, Ugh, and she's clearly not coping. So then she goes to talk to Pike, who's like, Look, I'm concerned about you, what's going on? And she's like, yeah, I do appreciate the irony. This is a communications officer who can't communicate what's wrong with her. Um, and then Kirk appears, because he has been speaking to. Well, this is nonsense as well. He could hail and give him this information, but no, he's got to go back to the Enterprise for no damn good reason, just so he can have that stupid scene at the end. It is stupid. See, whereas, to be honest, I read this at the, at the time I watched it, that he goes back in person because he's got the hots for Uhura because he was trying to. I'll tell you what, it would have been better if he got the hots for Pike, to be honest. But, you know, <laughs> cause, I mean, that handshake is quite nice. But again, we don't need it. It's just, oh, it's just silly. And, but I, I did read it that he had been trying to hit on Uhura uh, right. and that's why he went back. Anyway, Umbenga has detected damage to Ramon's brain around the speech centres, which is getting worse. Her and Ramon hear the sound again and he flips out, stabbing the doctor and making a run for it. He cuts some power conduits, plunging the ship into semi-darkness. Blimey. And literally all we see is two pipes being cut. Yep. And perhaps the triple redundancy hasn't come in yet, because we know about that in Date Space Nine, but boy do they need it. Because yeah. if you can plunge an entire deck, stroke the entire ship, couldn't tell which, into darkness just by cutting two pipes, then that really isn't clever, is it? <laughs> I thought it was the deck... Rather than the whole ship. I mean, they certainly travel quite a bit, but they may have travelled quite a bit on the same deck. I'm the, willing to that, give them that's the what benefit I thought. of the doubt for that. that that's but, what, yeah. I genuinely watching it, that's what I thought. Yeah. I did still think it was a bit easy, though. Yeah. Uhura has another turn with the corridors closing in on her, which is a good visual effect. Mm. I like the way they do that. And they do it all quite practically as well, I think. She then snaps out and heads back to sick bay on her own, which can't be a good idea. <laughs> Pike has met up with La'an and they come across Kirk, leading to an awkward hello, given what happened in Tomorrow and Tomorrow, etc. Uhura finds Ramon and tries to talk him down, but he starts a fuel pod in- ejection sequence, which we see happening in the background, which yeah. is a nice touch. Kirk arrives and beams himself, Uhura, himself and Uhura out of there before they get spaced. We see Ramon's grisly frozen corpse float that out. That is grisly. It's grim, isn't it? He's yeah. properly dead. He is, indeed. We get a very GNDN scene between La'an and Kirk, which... Again, we, we see all the backstory bit in the just for this bit. It's just stupid. Una accuses. Unfortunately, that plays into the bloody musical episode. No, well, I don't care because I'm not going there. Fine. Una accuses Pellier of being a messy space hippie. <laughs> <laughs> and they have quite a fun falling out, to be honest. I like this scene. Kirk and Uhura are going through Ramon's personal log, revealing that he was having the same kind of hallucinations as her. She shares her memories of losing her family on, in a shuttle crash. Which I think is what we saw when she was trying to sleep. Yes, when um, the cloudy thing. It, yeah. yeah, because she wasn't actually there and doesn't really know what it was like. Yeah. She says, but she knows what happened and keeps seeing it in her mind. Mm. Uh, he gives a big speech about facing up to death, which really doesn't fit the Kirk we've seen in Rafa Khan, who never, apparently never faced it. Yeah, except I mean, Rafa, it... Rafa Khan isn't brilliant for continuity, is it? Take Chekhov. Um, <laughs> well, there are ways around that one, but yes, fair but point. You, but you still have to make them. You still yes, have you to do. You do have to. In. Yeah, they didn't. Yeah, they should yeah. have made that clearer. Ma- Nicholas Meyer <laughs> was not interested in continuity. No, he was not. To be right. Fair. So there is a workaround for this if mm-hmm. you want one, and the workaround is that. Because I have genuinely was thinking about this, because I was like, I'm sure actually he has, you know, worried about his friends genuinely dying. Well, I mean, to be fair, in the original series, of course, Sam spoilers, but it's we've already covered it, yeah, so we no, have. Uh, Sam, Sam dies. dies. <laughs> so he has faced death. But also, what if what he means by this point in Wrath of Khan hmm. is that, but as, as a result of all the adventures that him and his besties have been on, where because of the way it's written, the besties never die. Yeah, he, he thinks he's a, invulnerable. Yeah. He's become over what, I don't, I'm not quite sure how long he's been captain of the Enterprise when Wrath of Khan is set, but I'm thinking maybe 20 odd years. Uh-huh. So he's had 20 odd years of his besties being repeatedly oh. put in peril and them not dying. To be fair, it's a five year mission. And then he gets made an admiral, so not much longer than five years. But yeah, anyway, the bottom line is yes, you. I mean, I think that's a fair point. But it just seems incredibly wrong that it's Kirk who's lecturing her on dealing with death when 
Really? <laughs> really, of all the people? <laughs> anyway. Yeah, but again, given that I don't like Kirk, totally fixed. Could, it's but just being, why not make arrogant. it another character for Everton? Why does it have to be Kirk? It has to be Kirk because they want us to do the wanky handshake at the end. That's why they want it to be Kirk. Stupid. I'm sorry. Oh, anyway. I, on the other hand, complete praise for Celia Rose Gooding's acting, which oh, is absolutely amazing. top notch. She's amazing you com- in this. She, you completely buy her as caught up in grief and losing her mind. And yeah, it's brilliant. The other one who I think, although he's not in it much, did, um, he's acting very well, is um, is his name Babs? I can't remember the surname. Who plays Doctor and Benga. Yeah, I would say Ken or something like that. Yeah, um, because the way he... He's he's criminally underused so far this season, yeah, isn't he? Yeah. I, mean, I know there is an episode that sent us more in, we'll get to that. But, uh, yeah. But, but he is, because yeah. you're right, he's one of the, the best actors. Well, they're all good. All the regulars they are, are all good. good. But, but tell you who isn't a good actor. Yeah. <sighs> Our friend playing Kirk, but never mind, because we've apparently got to have him. Oh, it depends what you're wanting from him. Anyway, the thing about I was going to say about Mbenga is he doesn't get much, but on the one hand, he is strict as the Doctor, but you the empathy is oozing from him. Do you know Mm. what I mean? When he's talking to Uhura and saying, you know, I know a stubborn patient when I see one. And I just, it might only be a short scene, but I did really appreciate his acting in it. Mm Mm-hmm. Anyway, she rewatches one of her training videos with Hamer, and by plot coincidence, he drops the techno babble needed for her to work out what's going on with Ramon and now her being used as universal translators by interdimensional beings. She goes to see Sam in his cool exobiology lab that has alien skeletons in it. I, I like love this. it. See, I I would much rather be with Sam. Kirk. Exactly. I would. Mean, all right. I'm still a bit questionable about it because he's not major. You know, one of the main characters, but at least he's got more justification of being there. The freaking. James T has. But anyway, she works out what her visions mean and the reveal, surprise, surprise, is the aliens are in the deuterium and the Enterprise is killing them. Now, initially I thought, oh, they're just rehashing Next Generation's Force of Nature, which we rewatched the other night uh, just in preparation for this. And it's not quite that because, yes, the similarities, you know, engines doing damage and putting people at risk, but the people being put at risk aren't interdimensional beings in Force of Nature. But, of course, it does also then remind me of Home Soil, that awful, awful first season Next Generation episode where it's, you know, they're doing mining and they're putting aliens at risk. I don't think they're interdimensional ones in that case, but they're unusual. They're silicon based or something. They're very unusual, so they're hard to detect. So it's like this is kind of rehashing two Next Generation plots, and neither of them were particularly good ones either, to be honest. So, hey, who? She tries to get the uh, start up of the refinery stopped, but it started five minutes ago, and just like trying to cancel something on a blooming uh, washing machine, it's not impossible these days without pulling the damn plug out. But there yep. we go. Ayura gets a vision of her parents' crash shuttle and sees zombie Hamer on the bridge. Because they can't shut the refinery down, they need to destroy it. Pike, being the thoroughly decent chap he is, trusts her and they evacuate the facility before them firing photon torpedoes, which seems really... It's this massive, great... Big, you think, oh boy, you're yeah. going to catch some hell for this, aren't yeah. you? I mean, you know, forget your fleet captain rank holding up much longer because, yeah, I mean, good job it was supposed to be temporary. Yeah. He also tells her to pass any comeback from Starfleet onto him again. What a guy. Yeah, <laughs> he's Ace Rimmer. Uh, but, but it is amazing he ever gets promoted again in the future, isn't it? Because he, he rubs Starfleet up the wrong way yeah. continually, doesn't he? Yeah. <laughs> Zombie Hamer is now looking as he did when he was alive, signalling they've been successful, which is not, I like that. And he smiles, which yeah, I like. Sweet. And again, you go, oh, sorry, I <laughs> wish they hadn't got rid of him. But anyway, Una complains Pelia gave her a scene at the Academy, which initially I was thinking, oh, for heaven's sake. I was always really pleased if I managed to see him. Um, uh, do you know what I thought? Yeah. So fucking Lisa Simpson. Yeah, exactly, yeah. But the engineer is wise enough to realise it's actually the death of her predecessor that's actually the issue, which is, you know, it's okay. There's some Riker-style jazz in the lounge. Oh, God. <laughs> which, oh. to be fair, is an improvement on some of the other music we've had so far this season. Uh, to be fair, this is an improvement on Riker-style jazz, but it <laughs> did make me think of it, bloody hell. <laughs> hey, give me warp in the factor of... Five, six, seven, eight. Oh, the jazz. Like, oh god what is it about Starfleet and fucking jazz yes, it's that or classical music. but again you see that it doesn't age as badly as that awful crap rap stuff they were using in the alternate earth one but anyway Sam tells his brother he's proud of him but they're still at odds or something I don't really understand what was going on there but well, and nor did I care to be frank <laughs> well no it's Sam is I thought 
that rather than waiting for an apology, Sam was waiting for some kind of acknowledgement of his contribution to solving the problem as an exobiologist and some kind of acknowledgement. Uh, well, that wasn't made clear, was it? Well, that's what I thought. But then mm. it turns out he was waiting for an apology. He says, oh, you're not going to apologise. For what? But, Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't care. Okay. But the thing is, again, for me, this feeds into this is why I don't like Kirk. He's a cunt. (laughs) Because I don't entirely know why necessarily he needed to apologise. But, you know, he should he should have reciprocated with at some point either saying I'm proud of you too, brother, or good work today, brother brother do you know what I mean rather than he's always he's you know in this episode he's dissing what his brother says oh he's exoworld again it's fucking relevant help solve the problem (laughs) you know the guy the guy is an arse that's why I don't like him yeah we don't need him that's the bottom line but then we get the first meeting between Kirk and Spock which is the whole justification for him being here let's face it um we didn't need they seem to bond over a shared dislike of Sam Kirk yeah which is weird but anyway and the whole scene just sort of peters out weirdly because that's not the obvious conclusion to the story because that's not what the story was about. So we have more jazz. I know, it's just so weird, that ending. Because it was a Hoorah-based episode that kind of gets hijacked right at the end for the Spock Kirk moment. And it's that didn't seem fair somehow. It's like, this isn't what this should be about. Ugh. Oh, dear. Strangely, Wells, why are you doing this? It's such a mess this season. Well, it didn't bother me as much as it bothered you. Uh Uh-huh. By a long way. Again, I mean, it's not awful. Don't get me wrong. And I, I like this better than some of the other episodes we've had so far this season. Uh, I'm thinking of the well, the, was it the last one we covered, the Charades one? Yes, yeah. that was yeah. Anyway, but it's, it's still not great, and certainly nowhere near as great as the first season stuff was. It might have made a really good examination of the perils of burying grief. I mean, there, there was yeah. that was there to be mined, but they didn't bother because again, they wanted to throw in all this other crap. But yeah, I, and I, I didn't like the sort. Of yeah, the retread of home soil, and yeah, yeah, that wasn't a good idea, really, was it? But never mind. See, I don't have an I don't have an issue with that at all because this is a we do have issues with people in the UK not caring about the consequences of mining and whatever. But it's more of an issue in the US where this show is predominantly airing. People need to hear the message. But again, um, they don't really centre on that either. In the same way as Force of Nature, really, that's what that's yeah. about, clearly, and. I mean, it was really nice to go back and watch the next generation. And that's not a particularly good one, don't get me wrong. But, you know, it's got a clear sort of moral compass. And it's the characters that you've, after seven years, after all, you've grown to know and love. And they're not, I mean, in some ways, it was running out of steam at that point, And perhaps it was time to move on. But it was interesting to compare that to this, where this season generally, where they're just trying loads of random shit and it's not working. Yeah. Hmm. Whereas I don't. I mostly don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with Kirk being involved. I like the way that um, we get to know a little bit more about Sam Kirk. I feel validated in the fact that I don't like actual Kirk because, again, you get more explanation. But and you can't have it both ways. Either you like this new Kirk or you you don't like Kirk at all because he's like this. I mean... <laughs> so I prefer this Kirk out of any of the Kirks. mm mm-hmm. But I don't really like the character of James T. Kirk. I mean, I liked him more in the the going the the time travel episode. You get to see you do get to see better sides of him here. To be fair, uh, but by the time he gets to the original series, he's an ass. And I reckon that the, the bad sides you see of him in this episode have been amplified by that point. So I don't mind him being there. Um, I agree with you that the ending is weak, hmm. and maybe it's just because I've watched so much Star Trek that. The first time I watched it, I was like, oh, yeah, that noise is people talking. Mm -hmm. That's communication. I don't know what you should have done with the noise instead, but that, for me, was let it down a lot, actually, that Mm -hmm. that, the reliance on that particular sound. Because without it... And let's face it, it could have made the sound anything, but by making it that, it is a bigger reveal. I wouldn't recommend Clown Car, but... (laughs) Thinking of the Ulysses. Ulysses, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But no, I wish they had, though. (laughs) But if, if the sound had not been, to me anyway, obviously, voices, mm. the whole thing would have worked a lot better. Yeah. Sound department letting it down. Yes. Me. So that's, But the sound department, the costume department and... Well, I didn't notice the costume. I'm sorry, but I didn't. <laughs> I, do, I just don't. I'm going to show you a picture in a minute. You're going to go, oh, yeah. Probably. Yeah. Anyway. Well. But this is this is another episode where a bit like we got watching that next gen episode, I just get the warm glowy feeling inside because I like these peoples. 
Well, I didn't because I was frustrated because we weren't spending enough time on the peoples I like. That's the problem. Because okay. <laughs> this this was theoretically a hura centered episode, but the, she really didn't get as much time as she should have done because we were spending far too much time in freaking Kirk's. But anyway, I I didn't think we did. Apart from I agree with you at the end. Mm. At the end should have been really really focused on Ahura. Yeah. Even if we ended with her finally getting a good night's sleep and we faded out as she did. Mm. To her finally closing her eyes and relaxing for the first time in goodness knows how long. But that's just one example. Or maybe she's in the bar with Pelia because she's beginning to come to terms with her grief and she can talk to Pelia now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, she's having a drink with her. But it needed to be... Or her and Una, for instance, sharing notes. Yeah, but it, it... it doesn't. It, in a way, it kind of doesn't matter. It needed to be that the episode ended on a Ahura and it didn't. And on that point, we are agreed. Right. Anyway, let's find out what other people thought. We've heard from Jeff Hyman. This is a pretty good one. Feels very next generation. Well, yes, there yeah, are two yeah, episodes. Yeah, yeah, we have mentioned that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In fact, it feels like the big twist was straight out of a next generation episode, but I couldn't pin it down exactly. Well, there you go. Celia Rose Gooding continues to impress. Yes, she does. Very much so. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Here you have. And we've heard from Sampo and Yona. Hello. Hello. So we just watched Lost in Translation. Uh, the one where Bill Murray is feeling outsider in Tokyo. No, not that one. Well, what happened in it? <laughs> uh, we got Not Kirk again. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Not Kirk. It helps not thinking that he's Not Kirk. because I mean, he could be any character, basically, because he's nothing like Kirk. I mean, I don't mind it, really. I mean, he doesn't have to try act like Shatner, but it just feels a bit pointless, really. They tried to make a big deal of Kirk and Spock meeting for the first time, but I'm just it felt nothing because I he didn't feel like Kirk. Hmm. I was wondering what will happen that they will end up together for mm. threesomes, or <laughs> what's that thing now? Yeah, well, I mean, basically Spock and Uhura, they'll stay on the Enterprise. Pike gets his accident, and I'm not sure does Kirk replace him, or is there someone there, so... I'm not sure how it goes, but yeah. Well, it's a prequel, so we know what's going to happen. And I was thinking about the bartenders. Are they also part of Starfleet or just like random subway workers? I mean, I think maybe like mess officers. So yeah. they're like, oh, I don't know what the real term is, but I mean, some people make the food and maybe they rotate yeah. that some of them sometimes they're... Or that the tending... machines make the food. Yes, that is true. It's, it's not completely clear to me how automated it is. I mean, do they actually... They do have real cookies. They made a big fuss about it. I mean, last week they had real herbs. Now they have, they have real cookies. So What's it, next? Maybe pickies. <laughs> Who knows? I guess replicated food isn't that good. I mean, they made that point before, so it wouldn't be yeah. new. But the uh, basic, I mean, the plot basically revolved around Uhura, which is not because we really haven't seen her much this season. So mm. this was... It but... took her so long to understand <laughs> that it was about the uh, communication. Yeah, but I really like that because, I mean, mm. through the whole episode, I was thinking, okay, this is some sort of invasion thing, invasion of the body snatchers mm. or something. And I mean, of course, that the, that's what the episode wanted. See what you did there. <laughs> wanted us to think because yeah. of all the sabotage and all that. But I mean, I, I like the premise. It was like Star Trek 101. They find a strange new life form that's yeah. different and they... Yes, I like it. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, because of what Starfleet represents, they... I mean, it wasn't even an argument. There's life here that we're hurting them. Okay, blow up the refinery. Well, although, that's the first time. <laughs> <laughs> although I one would think that blowing up the <laughs> refinery would also hurt them, but I guess not then because Hemmer was happy or the mm. Hemmer ghost. Uh, it, it, it was funny when Uhura was trying to calibrate the thing. You were like, he's watching <laughs> how to do it on YouTube, which is basically <laughs> what I do if I have to fix something. <laughs> Just, very, very today. Yeah. A few criticisms. One, I mean, security is just pitiful on the Enterprise. I mean, there's someone here who's clearly not himself and he's sabotaged the array already. Mm. Why aren't they confining him? Really too easy for him to... Apparently, if you're not one of the main characters, you can do anything you want. Yeah, I mean, he can just cut the power from the Mm -hmm. lights and blow up in a cell. And it seems that there was only like three people who were (laughs) chasing him or something. Mm. And another thing, I think Uhura was correct when she said, you need to confine me. It was silly that she was like, okay, I'm not okay. I need to be confined. And they were like, no, we won't do that. Mm. Mm. But otherwise I liked it. 
Okay, another person we really haven't seen almost at all is the new chief engineer. It was like, I mean, she's grown on me a bit, although we haven't really seen her much. But it, does it feel a bit silly that people are holding Hemorrhage death against her? Because, I mean, it, well, they're not doing that, but I guess, well, maybe the point was that even though they are in Starfleet and they are meant to sort of face death regularly, not everyone can do that. Um, I think that the point they tried to make is that they know that in the 60s, 70s, they faced all kinds of death all the time and seemed fine. And now they are like trying to somehow tell us that maybe they were, weren't fine. Mm, that's true because uh, a relevant example, Turk's brother died in one episode of the original mm. series and it bothered him for five seconds and yeah. that it wasn't mentioned again for the whole episode, I think, or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> or ever again. To be. Yeah. But yeah, again, I like this. I think the season has been strong so far. And Indeed. I'm, and I'm really excited about the next episode. So. Logically. Yeah, I have a, <laughs> I have a specific reason for that because that's the one I've been waiting for the most. What? Well, you'll see in two weeks. Oh, will I? <laughs> yes, you will. But yeah, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh, I do hope she's seen that other series, because otherwise it's going to be a very weird watch. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, you quite put your finger on it. It's it's not it's not Kirk and vaguely Spock meeting. Why should we care? <laughs> in terms of the replicated food and real cookies or whatever, mm. we in the original series replicated food is like monkey cube shit. It does look odd. Yes. Right. It's... So I'm wondering if replicated food is the equivalent, think maritime, of ship's biscuits. So if they've been somewhere recently enough that they can pick up decent supplies, they can have their real cookies. Mm-hmm. And they can have proper food. Well, you can make cookies fairly easy. And let's face it, Pike's blooming cooking every blooming day, isn't he? So yeah. I'm just wondering if he ever uses the replicators or... Possibly he doesn't. Yeah. But I just wonder whether it's one of those things that the rest of the crew, the ordinary crew, do have access to proper food some of the time. But if they've been in space a long time, all they've got is those glowy yeah. cubes of rum. And we do know the replicators are more primitive in this yeah. era, so that's okay. That that bit works at least. Yeah. But it is, you're right. It's it's it is a bit silly that Una is anti Pelia on the basis that. Yeah. yeah, you'd thought she'd be handling death by now, but anyway. Yeah, and in terms of... It it does take her a long time to understand it's about communication, given that she's a communications officer. You would think she would pick up on it sooner. For me, the reason she doesn't is because she's so sleep-deprived. Mm. But you're right, it does seem to take her longer than you would expect, given what we know of her as a character. Yeah, and she's, you know, I mean, she's traumatised for us, isn't she, yeah. bless her? So yeah. I give her some leeway for that, yeah. And you're right, security is pitiful. It, it, <laughs> Yonder's right, it does seem to be if you're a minor character, you can do what you like. You don't have to be confined to quarters, whatever, none of that happens. I mean, he's been bloody sabotaging the, mm. the refinery. He should be fucking locked so up. That security guy couldn't shoot straight either to save his life. It's like a bloody storm trooper. Well, he was, wasn't he? Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, they're chasing him down, but there's only four people apparently oh, chasing him down. Where's that, all the rest of the crew? Hiding? I don't know. <sighs> Weird. Yes. <laughs> that, that didn't work. No mind. Let's hear from the Llama God. Lance, oh, look, Scotty, fix a care, care, arc. I don't like when it's not about me. Now, in theory, this should be a really good episode because this is an episode that deals with trauma, trauma that's happened to characters that we love and trauma that's involving the loss of characters that we love. So this should be a pretty strong episode and it's the kind of thing that Star Trek can do really well. Unfortunately, this one doesn't really land particularly well and there's probably a couple of reasons for that. One of the reasons maybe is because of time because the focus of the episode is Hammer's Lost and it's now been at least five episodes since he passed away. I think six, maybe even seven since he passed away. So things aren't quite as raw yet. And yes, obviously there's trauma. Trauma lasts for a while, so yeah. But, you know, in terms of making television drama work, it doesn't work quite so well when there's such a huge gap between it and we haven't been reminded of the character's loss for quite some time. But obviously the real issue here, and it is the ham in the room, so I'm going to go straight to addressing it. The real issue here is the fact that the focus is off and the focus is off because of the presence of one James Tiberius Kirk. Now I've said in previous episodes it's been in, it's not been so bad that we've had a Kirk because it's never been the real Kirk. This is the first time we've actually seen the proper prime Kirk. This one isn't from an alternate timeline or anything. Now when we covered episode 3 of season 2, my opinion was that it wasn't so bad that Kirk was there because he didn't actually pull focus away from Lan. The story was still 
still Lan's story. The episode was very much about her. And in fact, having someone that was familiar to the audience, but not really familiar to her, is what made the story work and what allowed her to come out of her shell and everything. So it really worked really well. Here, unfortunately, it's less so. The focus of the episode really should be on Uhura and some of the other characters, but instead, Kirk seems to pull focus in every scene that he's in. And given how, unfortunately, slightly charisma-free Paul Wesley actually is, it's not down to the acting, it is down to the writing. But yeah, we get the scenes where Uhura's there, but Kirk ends up talking about his own problems. We get the James Kirk and Sam Kirk issues. We get Kirk talking to Lan. We get Kirk's dad issues. It becomes very much about Kirk this episode, and it really pulls away from the current crew of the Enterprise, which is who we should really be focusing on here. And that's a shame, because the Uhura stuff could be really good. There's a lot there to deal with, and her relationship with him was one of the strongest parts of season one. So yeah, there could have been some really good stuff there, but it does really detract from that. And we've also got the stuff between Una and Pelia as well. Again, that would be something really interesting to have dug into, but that ends up feeling very much like a C-plot in this episode, which should be the case for the actual series regulars. So yeah, that's something where it's not particularly successful at all, unfortunately. And the thing is, I don't want to criticise it too much, though, because the Kirk stuff is nice, and maybe that's because the writer spent so much time focusing on it. But it is nice. It's really nice to see him developing this kind of camaraderie with Ahura, given that their first meeting is when she strikes him. And it gives you some sort of sense of history that they have, that is why she's still serving on the Enterprise when he takes command. Yeah, there's some really good stuff there, some really good character building. Obviously, it's a shame we don't ever see that built on in the original series, because, uh, well, you know, that was a time, etc., etc. But it does lay some really good foundations there. And his general attitude towards people in general is why you can see that people start to follow him, especially at this stage of his career where he's not the charismatic ladies man. But as I say, even in talking about it, I am once again talking about Kirk again because Kirk is just such a big force in this episode, such a big presence, and it just pulls focus away from the characters that we actually want to be watching, which, again, this episode should have been about the crew of the Enterprise, Strange New Worlds Enterprise that we know, and it's kind of not, which is a bit of a shame. The mystery is also a really good one. I like the conceit of the aliens, interdimensional beings that are communicating through deuterium. Yeah, it's a nice idea. We really love the idea. Again, this is something that started us really well. The fact that Nebula was alive. Yeah, great one. Really like that idea. The fact they communicate with metaphor for loss. Yeah, love it. Great episode. So, yeah, it is a good one. But I think the episode would be much better if it had been Pike taking the lead. Because this is an episode that really called for a kind of space dad to be present, and Pike really isn't. Obviously, we know now we will production issues, etc., etc. But still, it would be much better if Pike had been taking the charge, which, which is a shame. But on the plus side, we do actually get the first now canon meeting between Kirk and Spock. And it is actually rather an understated moment, which is so good after all the pomp and portentousness and the universe bending drama of the 2009 Star Trek film, where their friendship was the most important thing in the universe. Yeah, this is just two guys who meet and then they happen to bond over their dislike for Kirk's brother. So, you yeah, know, that's a nice little thing, a very nice little character beat. And I actually really like that there wasn't like, this momentous thing. They just met in a bar and that was that. I kind of like that. So, yeah, I'm happy with that. But again, we're back to Kirk. We're back to Kirk, aren't we? The only other nigga I had about the episode, really, is something that always annoys me and I, if I'd been feeling better from the next generation at the time, I would have done. But the fact they have a control room in the warp cell, like, what, really? Why Why would you want to have an engineering room there? Really? The thing that distorts space time? Why Why would you have a room in there? That it just makes no sense. But they kind of inherited that from the next generation, so I can't blame them too much for that. So, yeah, this episode does have some nice bits. You know, seeing the footage of her and Hema, that was really nice. But, yeah, it just it just needed about 100% less Kirk. Oh, well. Let's just hope he doesn't pop up again this season, yeah? yeah. Anyway, anyway, I'll be interested to find out what other people made this episode. I hope that nobody's find themselves reduced to a bit part in their own lives. And until next time, glory to you and your cast. Yep, yep, and yep. <laughs> Not enough Pike. Too much Kirk. You can practically hear Shatner saying, can't you, when Kirk isn't on screen, everybody should be talking about Kirk. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, this isn't his show. It shouldn't be his show. Get rid of him. <laughs> we saw plenty of him in the original series. We don't need to see any more. <laughs> <laughs> on a totally different note, why is there a control room in, in the nasal? Well, it was to do with fuel pods or some such, was it not? So you can expect some sort of access room, whether it's a control room, that's probably a bit more of a stretch. But yeah, I mean, you can understand them needing to access it. But yeah, OK. I mean, certainly there wouldn't be somebody in there generally, one would hope. <laughs> it's just when you need to access this particular bit of circuitry, but... Yeah, <laughs> fair point. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the, the issue about Hamer's loss being four episodes ago, not just four episodes ago, but also a season as well. Yeah. I mean, that makes a huge difference in time. Possibly that, yeah, they should have acted on that sooner, I don't know, but they couldn't because he died at the end of the season. So, you know. Yeah. Anyway, thank you, Lomagard. Thank you. And now we hear from the Pie Man. Hello, Ark. How are you here to talk about um, Lost in Translation? Um, yeah, not the, the Bill Murray film, obviously, the uh, episode of uh, Star Trek Strange New Worlds. And um, I was a bit lukewarm in this one uh, when I first saw it, but actually, on the rewatch, I've really come to like it. I think it's uh, got some good themes uh, covering the idea that uh, 
a lot of the crew, particularly um, Uhura, obviously, and um, Una, have uh, been missing Hemmer, and it's nice to have some fallout from that. Uh, you know, you have everything from Uhura using effectively Hemmer's YouTube channel um, to to learn how to fix bits of the ship, um, and uh, yes, uh, you know, on the other hand, Una's conflict with the new chief engineer. Um, being there because uh, she sees her as a replacement. Um, and I thought both of those were quite cute subplots. Obviously the main one, uh, I think probably why I um, did initially rate this one a bit lower was because I did kind of predict quite early on what the issue was. We've seen this in Star Trek before. Um, something in the space or something in the area or something that they're absorbing um, is is being killed by that process, but they don't know because they can't see it with the sensors. Um, I like to say we've seen this plot before, so plot wise it's not particularly original, and you're kind of quite early on going, oh hang on, there's something in the deuterium, um, and you know a living thing that they can't detect. Uh, but it works quite well. There's some uh, decent sort of tense horror stuff uh, with them creeping through the dark corridors of the ship. Um, there's some uh, you know, there's a sort of general sci-fi plot. Uh, I mean, uh, there's just some really good acting from Celia Rose Gooding. Uh, she's an absolute powerhouse in this. Um, you know, again, obviously, it's always tinged a little with God of the Given Nichelle Nichols stuff like this to do when she was um, playing Uhura. But nonetheless, you can't hold that against the actor um, who's now in the situation and is actually getting stuff written for her. And yes, there's more about Uhura in this episode than I think there was in most of TOS. Um, you know, about her backstory, about, you know, we've heard bits of this before as well, um, but it's just tying nicely together. Um, we had technically our first appearance of actual Kirk, because uh, other two times we've seen this actor playing Kirk, he's been uh, either an alternate unit, well, in a, some form of alternate universe. Um, so this is the first time we really see, well, I suppose we saw him on a pad, but in person, first time we see actual Kirk. Um, and yeah, they had to do a bit of um, sugling of uh, your know, ranks and whatnot to temporarily make Pike a fleet captain because the Farragut's also involved. Although I don't believe we saw her, so boo. Um, but yeah, they had to make Pike a fleet captain because in the original series, Kirk says, oh, he was a fleet captain when I met him. Um, damned if we can't just forget something that was said during the menagerie. But uh, yeah, I suppose, you know, every line. Um, it's a great derelict, derelict about this, isn't there? Um, yeah, and anyway, so, so Pink gets a, a new badge temporarily for this episode. Um, but yeah, uh, I thought the, um, the refinery was pretty good. I like the fact that it looked industrial, but they didn't make it look like the bloody event horizon. So often when those places are going to be dark and scary, they're suddenly made into like weird gothic structures, and uh, I, I like that. Um, I liked our sort of other guy who was being slowly driven mad by the, the voices. Um, I thought he was interesting. You know, what we saw from him was quite good. And again, uh, you know, he didn't say much, but uh, yeah, sadly came to quite a bad end. Um, and yeah, overall, you know, there's some horror Im imagery, but uh, yeah, overall, it just does a lot of stuff quite well. I think probably about the only bum note for me was actually, um, yeah, the Lan Kirk stuff, which I do find completely unnecessary. Um, there's kind of a wee plot thread there that I know doesn't go anywhere, so those scenes just seem pretty superfluous. Um, but overall, actually, yeah, this was a really good episode. And again, much credit to Celia Rose Gooding for um, for our acting. Oh, and one final thing. I like the fact that Pike just believed her. Uh, you know, there wasn't any, you know, damn it, you have to justify it. it just, if you say it, you say it, and I'll square it off with Starfleet. So again, nice thing on the how, what a captain he is. Um, so all that remains for me to say is do keep up the good work. I always look forward to the podcast and hopefully feedback in the next one. But until then, bye for now. Bye. Bye. No, you're right. Pike is, is great. Yeah. He, but we needed... It would have been not... I mean, I guess that it was, you know, still some form of paternity leave or mm. something. But how much nice it would it have been to have Pike, the one in those scenes with Kirk and Uhura, being the space dad and... Mm. Because he is a lovely, lovely character. He makes you feel of a warm glow. Yeah, no, he's he's the guy that the show should be about. So. Well, he's why the show got started because it, when they saw him on Discovery, fans mm. wanted to see more of Pike. Yep, yep, yeah. But yeah, he is predictable and unoriginal, I'm afraid, and that does really hamstring it.
Yeah, but then on the other hand, Celia Rose Gooding is he's really good in it. Yeah. Really good, and yeah, it does make you. There's nothing that can be done about it, but it is. It does make you realise how much of a shame it was that mm. Michelle never got this sort of stuff. Yeah. Did it? And not seeing the Farragut, that was annoying. I I was looking oh, really carefully this time round, and no, they don't show it once. Not even a, you know, copy paste of the Constitution design. Boo. Oh. Sorry, they got the uniforms wrong and they didn't show you a spaceship. That's the real reason you're grumpy. Well, some of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, no, I'd be lying if I said that wasn't part of it. It's not all of it, though. No I, no, I am really aggrieved that they're wasting so much time on Kirk on this series because it isn't about him. I, I think <clears throat> what they've done is they haven't been able to have Anson Mount. Yeah, so they filled the gap with... And that's yeah, what they filled the gap with. Yeah, they so chose it, poorly, I'm afraid. Anyway. Well, at least it wasn't even more exploration of Spock and his emotions. Well, true enough. There we go. Right. Well, thank you to everybody who's fed back. Thank you. Uh, I think we might be feeling slightly differently about the next episode, which is the one episode of the season I had rewatched for yeah. my birthday. Yeah. It's those old scientists, everybody. Uh, which technically I think is more of an episode of Lower Decks than it is New Strangely Worlds, but that's not a bad thing. Yeah. <laughs> but as I say, I will be fascinating to hear what, what Rihanna says, particularly if she hasn't ever seen Lower Decks. But uh, yes, we're recording out on the 25th of this month. We shall catch you then. Take care. Cheery bye. Bye bye. The Star Trek theme was written by Alexander Courage and here was arranged and performed by Drew Barker. The artwork was created by Andy Pelastides. All music referenced is for illustrative purposes only and no copyright infringement is intended. Find our website at broadcast.libsyn.com And we have a YouTube channel as well. Send emails or mp3s to broadcast at gmail.com Shut it down!